All right, so we are going to jump right in. We have about 90 people in the room right now, so and that is growing. So we're so excited to have all of you here. Um, I will go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Lottis Feliciano, and I am the Art Grants Manager for Redline Contemporary Art Center. Redline Contemporary Art Center is based in Denver and is a contemporary art center that serves the state of Colorado, um, but has a home base in the Five Points neighborhood of Denver um, and acts as a re-granting agency for several grants, including Arts and Society. Um, while Redline is based in Denver, I am now based in Alamosa, Colorado. So I am in Southern Colorado. And, um, and we are just so excited to, to be here in Southern Colorado and to be um, closer to some of these amazing projects. 95 people now in the room, this is amazing. This is like the biggest party I've been to in a long time. Okay. So actually, before I jump into talking about what Arts and Society is, I'd love to introduce us to Louise Martirano. Louise is the Executive Director of Redline Contemporary Art Center and one of the visionaries behind this project. Um, Louise was part of launching this project in 2017. Uh, Louise, can you say hello? Hey, everybody. It's so great to see you all. I'm also so excited that you have such a a uh, large community of folks uh, signing in. Also, hey to our folks from Carl Creative Industries and Denver Arts and Venues who are part of the funders of this collaborative grant making program. I, yeah, I am so biased to what this is trying to do, which is to get everybody to get together and share resources to uh, make things more accessible and easier for the all the good work you're doing to happen. So it just, it's an honor and a privilege to be in this room with you guys today. And I just wish it was in person because of my feelings around Zoom. But anyway, <laughs> nice to see you all. <laughs> and thank you, Laura, as our fearless leader of this program. Thank you, Louise. Um, yes, it's it's so great to be here. I know Zoom is not ideal, but it is a way that literally a hundred uh, creatives across Colorado can get together and talk about this incredible work. So I really, really appreciate all of you being here. Um, so again, before we jump in, just for folks who just came in, please make sure to mute yourself. Um, we will have time for questions at the end, um, but we want to make sure we don't have any kind of background noise and whatnot. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of the basics. Oh, and we are recording the session. Louise, I just sent a request to you to record yep. as well, just as like a backup. Um, I want to like, we can quadruple record it to make sure that we have it. <laughs> so we can share this with all of you after the session. And then um, we will also post to our website. So Arts and Society. Arts and Society is a collaborative grant making program that fosters cross-sector work through the arts. The grant program is administered by Redline Contemporary Art Center, and it's funded by a cohort of Colorado foundations and government agencies. So here we've got a, a lineup of our wonderful partners. Um, these are our 2023 partners, Bonfi Stanton Foundation, Colorado Creative Industries, Denver Arts and Venues, and the Colorado Health Foundation. And then of course, Redline is the administrator of this program. Um, I also want to share that El Pomar and the Jed Edmondson Foundation also joined the collaborative too. So for this cycle of grants, um, welcoming those two additional funders, which just got confirmed last week. So. Uh, it's the best news. Thank you so much, <laughs> Louise. That's awesome. Sure. Um, and what a great announcement to have like during during this info session, because I just think it is such an incredible um just incredible reference to the work that arts and society um, supports. And so, you know, the collaborative of arts and society is a group of funders who each have their own missions, their own um, structures, their own visions, um, but they all agree that the arts are instrumental in creating social change. And so they have decided to come together um, and pool their resources. And now we have two new funders, um, part of the collaborative, who also um, believe in this work. And together, through this collaboration, um, they're able to fund this work. 
And so that is very reflective of the kinds of projects that we fund as well. So I'll go more into detail at the end. I'll have a little bit more time for um, examples as well of past projects. You can get a sense of this. Um, but I really do think that our funding model is a mirror to the projects that we fund um, in that it is a, a beautiful melding of um, different entities with, with different skills and resources and visions coming together to create change. So what is cross-sector work? Um, Cross-sector work really focuses on collaborative projects that bring together the arts um, with other se sectors that don't necessarily immediately work with the arts. And of course, you know, the Colorado Health Foundation being one of our funders is a great example of that. The Health Foundation recognizes the incredible value that the arts play in our physical and mental health. Um, and so when we talk about cross-sector work, we're talking often about the arts and, the arts and agriculture, the arts and mental health, the arts and um, immigration, the arts and cats, <laughs> the arts and uh, youth development. The list goes on and on, and you know best what those issues are in your community. Um, and we are really excited to hear from you about what that and is in your, in your community, in your town. And the funding is available to projects across the state of Colorado. This is a statewide program. So um, just to give you some more details about what the like what the program actually provides, um, first and foremost, there's financial support with the grant. We provide $5,000 to $35,000 in grant support, and we do not require matching funds. Um, so oftentimes when you are applying for um, different uh, grant opportunities, applying to foundations, you are required to provide a match of the funds that you're asking for. In this case, we do not ask for that. So this is oftentimes, um, a lot of times nonprofits and other groups will use arts and society as their match for another fund. Um, and so that is, you know, that is absolutely possible, um, but we wanna make sure that you know that there's flexibility there. I also wanted to jump in and say what is, what's cool about this program is arts and society operates with a spirit of kind of innovation too. And, and it's just like, if you have a project that is not, that nobody has believed in and nobody has funded before, Arts and Society is like also here for that purpose. It's like, how can this grant help secure or our message to other funders that your project is worth funding and it helps to support the optics that we all as nonprofits and individuals deal with when it comes to philanthropy and, you know, what is considered credibility or, or whatever, but arts and society understands that in this re, in this re, non requirement, and that oftentimes you know people don't want to take a chance, or you know agencies don't want to take a chance on a project that's not been funded. So it's the spirit of this program to fund those projects that maybe it's the first year, or it's you know a pilot program that's really been. Um, it occurred through volunteer work. And now this will allow for support to go to those collaborators and those individuals in that community that's made it happen. Thank you, Louise, that's awesome context. A couple other things that the program provides, we host learning community meetings. Um, and these are meetings where we gather all of the grantees together, uh, learn about what projects everyone is doing, learn about the work um, folks are taking on. And then it's often a really great opportunity for um, community building within the cohort, um, really making connections. It's wild uh, to see folks, you know, you've got someone in Gunnison or realizing that they are like fully aligned with something that's happening in Trinidad and there's this beautiful connection. Um, so we love to see that happen. We also do a lot of professional development during our learning community meetings. Um, we bring in, you know, best practices, panels, funders, opportunities to connect with other funders. Um, so it's really about providing a space um, for growth and connection. Um, it's also a lot of fun and we have snacks. <laughs> um, and I try always to make, uh, make us make art. So you will probably make art in learning community meetings. Um, it's always a really, really good time. We just had our last learning community meeting in Colorado Springs, and it was just, um, 
it was a blast. It was really, really a great time. We also provide evaluation support. So as you are working on evaluating your programs um, and doing your own surveys and you know gathering data about your programs, we provide support for that. We also provide support for marketing and communications, blog posts, getting the word out about your programs. Um, we really like to brag <laughs> about what you're doing. Um, and so we provide a vehicle for that. We also do mini documentaries of our grantee projects. I will say we're a little bit backlogged from the pandemic, but we are working on getting all of those mini documentaries created. And we have examples um, on our website and our YouTube that you can check out. Okay, so who is eligible for Arts and Society? So Arts and Society is open to nonprofits and individuals. It's not open to government agencies. Um, it's open to uh, LLCs. It's open to pretty much literally everyone. Um, and this is one of the things that I love about this grant is that, um, you know, there's really no the only barrier is that you have to apply, right? You have to apply, but you don't have to be a 501c3. You don't have to be, um, you know, established in that way. Um, now, if you are super new to grant writing, um, congratulations for being here. We're so glad you're here. Um, I will share this at the end, but I do have, um, I will have time for office hours to talk to folks about your um, letter of intent and your application. And so, you know, for those of you who are like, okay, it's open to everyone, but I don't, I've never done this before. Um, we do have um, some time to chat and provide some support for you. Um, we want you to be um, empowered to apply. Um, the primary applicant must be from Colorado. So, you might be partnering with an organization or an artist outside of the state of Colorado. That is totally fine. Um, but the main applicant has to be based in Colorado um, and the work really has to happen in Colorado. And if you're not sure kind of how to think of it, it's like this program is really about supporting Coloradans and supporting our beautiful um, creative economy and um, community work. And so we want to make sure that these funds are really supporting projects that will um, will really be for Coloradans um, and, and be something that uh, the Colorado community, whichever corner of the state you're in, um, will really have access to. So the partner organization um, must play an in an uh, and implement, um, sorry, excuse me, part, the partner organization must play a critical role in the implementation of the project. So you can't just kind of have an organization that is um, maybe saying, oh yeah, we're in Colorado, we support this, but literally everything is happening um, out of state. Louise, did you want to provide context to that? <laughs> No, no, I, I didn't have, that is just, that is correct. Yeah. I mean, that the, there, there can be, um, out of state collaborators, but the project itself needs to benefit the counties of Colorado. So like you, you could have a visiting artist involved, but it, you know, to anchor, anchor the issue that you're addressing uniquely to the Colorado community, and, and how how that is in connection with that community's issue is, I think, the key component. Thank you. Um, and then uh, lastly, I, I mentioned this already, but organizations, individual schools, government agencies are all eligible to apply. If you're not sure, if you're like, you're still like, I still don't know if we're eligible or not, you can shoot me an email. Um, and again, I will have a link for office hours. The link is actually already on the website um, to sign up for office hours. Okay, so a little bit more about um, the kinds of projects that we're looking for. So we're specifically looking for projects that demonstrate a high level of collaboration. You really hear us kind of hammering in that word collaboration. Um, we want to see work between artists, organizations, um, community members, community leaders, um, you know, educators, activists, we really want to see a, a number of folks coming together um, to address a problem in a targeted community. Previous grantees are eligible to apply. Um, I see a lot of uh, past grantees on the call. Hello. Um, if you are unsure of your eligibility, just reach out to me, but essentially you just need to be up to date on all of your reporting. 
um, and you will not really receive overlapping funding for the same project. Um, so we want to make sure you've closed out a project um, before jumping into another one. Again, if you're not sure, just shoot me an email and we can talk about it. Okay. And let's see. Okay, so what does this application process actually look like? Um, so we're doing things a little bit differently this year, but it is it is returning to a two-step application process. So we're kind of going back to the old ways, if you will, the old ways of 2017. Um, and <laughs> what we are asking folks is to submit a letter of intent outlining their vision for their arts and society project. So the, the thinking here is that, you know, in the past we had, um, the past couple of years, because of the pandemic, we really expedited the process we wanted to be able to like have an application process you submit it and then you know the money turns around pretty quick right um a two-step process kind of lengthens uh the process the timeline um but what we saw last year was that we had such um such an increase of applications i mean we had a lot of applications um i want to say close to 300 last year um, and um, at that number of applications, you know, we are, um, and I'll go into more of these statistics in a minute here, but we're going to fund around 20, between 20 and 24 projects, roughly. Um, and so with that kind of, that kind of ratio, we thought, man, it's really, it's really hard to ask so many people to put together a full proposal when the odds are what they are, um, and then to have our panelists review full proposals again with the odds what they are. So with this new um, letter of intent process, what we're asking is for you to really tell us about the vision of your project. It's less about the nitty gritty, and I will go over the actual um, LOI questions in a minute here. Um, but this is hopefully takes the lift off a little bit, so it's not such a heavy um, heavy load in the application process initially. And then what we will do is after a panel review, selected applicants will be asked to submit a detailed proposal before final funding decisions are made. So we will have a, um, a group of finalists who will be asked to submit a full, full proposal. Um, we'll have more details on that full proposal soon, but it's essentially you know, giving us more details, budget, timeline, um, these kinds of things. And I'm going to talk a little bit about budget um, in this info session, even though we don't ask for it in the letter of intent, I think it's good to be thinking about numbers while you're thinking about the overall vision. Applications are due um, on September 1st at 11.59 p.m. It's uh, very much um, Cinderella's uh, carriage, it will turn into a pumpkin at exactly midnight and you won't be able to access the application. Um, everything is on submittable. You are able to create an account. Um, it's free to create an account, work on your application, save your application, come back to it. So there is, you know, a good amount of um, uh, kind of flexibility there for you to work on it, go and, and, you know, stare at the, stare at the sky for a little bit and then return to it. Um, I will say, you know, it's it's a really smooth system and it will at at exactly midnight, it's it's done so. So I really encourage folks to um to get on there ahead of time. You know, you might want to hit submit on September 1st, and that's so valid and do that. Um, but save yourself some anxiety and, and get things rolling ahead of time, even if you're just putting in your name and information. So you've got things going. Um, and so you're not kind of frantically putting everything in um, on the first at, you know, 1150. I've, I've been there. <laughs> I, could, I say this um, for your own for your own mental health. So here's a little bit about the timeline. Um, so the application um, LOI opened on July 1st. Here we are on August 7th having our Zoom info session. Uh, September 1st, that application closes at midnight. And then on November 1st, proposal invites will be sent out. So November 1st is when we will be letting folks know, hey, you are a finalist. We want to see a full proposal or, hey, thank you so much for your application. Unfortunately, you have not been selected as a finalist. So we will be giving those notifications out in November. Um, and it's um, it'll be a pretty 
pretty quick turnaround for the full proposals, but we do have a, a I think it's a decent amount of time for you to work on those full proposals. Um, that proposal deadline will be January 10th. So we've given you kind of just over the holidays. Um, and I will do some sessions, um, provide some kind of one-on-one -on -one sessions for folks at that point as well to help with the, um, the full proposal process. In March of 2024, grantees will be notified and April 2024, the grantees will be announced. So the funds will be sent out um, in that March, April time. So be thinking about that too, as you're putting together your proposal, um, the funds will be available in the spring of 2024. So that's really the earliest you'll be able to start your project. And I see we have a lot of questions coming through. Thank you, Louise, for handling all of this. You're awesome. You're just the freaking best. Thank you. <laughs> okay, jumping into the LOI itself. So LOI, letter of intent, you're telling us what you intend to do. Um, and this is this is it. This is all of it right here. I've also put this on the website so you can see it on the website. So if you want to review it before you jump into submittable, you can, or you want to throw it together before you're in submittable. But this is what you will see when you go into submittable to create your um, your letter of intent. We have your project title. Um, and I do have a I do have a word count on the project title, no more than 10 words. And I, I've had to do this because you, you brilliant Coloradans are just verbose with your uh, <laughs> with your titles. Um, so we just want to make sure that the title is, you know, says what the project is, but also, you know, is, is really clear and to the point. Um, and you can always do um, parentheses working title. We love that. We can always, you know, this is, this is creative work. Um, and so it's okay if it's, um, it's not set in stone yet. Requested amount. So again, we are, um, we are having, uh, we are offering between $5,000 and $35,000. So you can ask for up to $35,000. Um, if you're not sure, again, this is a question you can email me or we can talk about in, um, in office hours. Um, if you're not sure how much to ask for, I say, ask for what you need. Ask for what you need, which is your total project cost, right? So your total project cost might be 35,000, but you might have a bigger project, right? You might be trying to do something that's, you know, is gonna cost you like, you know, 75, 80 grand. And so you're asking for 35 to, um, to you know, fill in um, part of that overall budget. We wanna know your project date, start and end. Um, and again, I just have to emphasize that we know this is a work in progress. This is a letter of intent. It's what you intend to do. So, you know, it's okay if things change later on, your start and end date might change, like time is fluid, we get it. So don't be stressing too much about um, kind of hammered down details. We're looking for vision. What are you imagining this to look like? We don't wanna know what Colorado counties your project will occur in. Um, and it might just be, you know, it might be one county. It might be multiple counties. Um, this is your opportunity to tell us where. And then we have a question for you to tell us a little bit more. What is the city, neighborhood, town, location of your project? And this is an opportunity to really tell a little bit more, hey, this is happening in, um, you know, a neighborhood, um, of the city where a number of schools have been closed and we are gathering, um, you know, local families who are now having to uh, bus to another neighborhood for schools, something like that. You know, this is an opportunity to, to provide, provide some context. Then for 500 words, we're asking you to tell us about your project. What inspired the idea? Who are the artists or partners involved? What's the vision? Just tell us about it. Um, and then we want to know about your community and how will they be engaged. So this is sort of jumping off of um, what is the city and neighborhood location of your project. Well, how are these folks going to be involved? Who, who is the community and how are they going to be engaged? And then we want to know how are the arts going to be used to address a social issue in your community? So really taking the community piece, the issue that you are addressing, um, and, and demonstrating to us how the arts are being used. Is it a uh, is it a multimedia performance parade through town? I want to do that. Um, is it you know a mural um, at a school? Is it um, you know a series of workshops? How are the arts being used to address this issue? 
And I do want to add to this because this comes up a lot in the panel process. Um, you know, if you are an artist applying for this a grant and your project really is looking at supporting people experiencing homelessness, or if it's looking at the criminal justice system, or if it's looking at when you think about your collaborator, make sure that your collaborator sits firmly in that social issue professionally. And, and it may be a small community. And so maybe that's more of a like a, a, a social worker or a health worker or someone who just holds the expertise. And though there are, I mean, why I love artists so much is you guys appear in so many categories of this life and world, and you typically are two or three people in one, but it is something that I just want to share. It comes up in the panel a lot is that, you know, can, you know, similar, the same respect is given on the other side. So if you're a human services organization or nonprofit and you're focused on the social issue as your priority, who is the art expertise that you're engaging? So both sides of that um, just needs to need to be uh, even when it comes to how you're recognizing your collaborators, your community and how you're framing it, if that makes sense. Thank you, Louise. Um, and again, you know, I um, we we timed this info session kind of smack in the middle of the um, LOI process. So there's time to kind of sort through these things. If you've got questions, you can email me, um, or we can have um, office hours to discuss as well. Now, one thing that came up as we were talking to artists and um, and all kinds of community members about returning to the LOI process um, is that. It's really frustrating when you're an artist and you're applying for art things and the only opportunity you have is um, the written word, you know, that the all you have is the written word to share what it is that you're trying to do. And so we wanted to provide an opportunity in the LOI for you to um, attach images, examples, supporting documentation, sketches if you have them, you know, anything that you think um, represents or demonstrates kind of the vision of what you're trying to do. This is optional, so it's not required. Um, but we know a lot of a lot of folks um, really are are more visual in our uh, I'm speaking for myself, more visual in our um, expression, and so this is an opportunity to do that. We also have a space for links, two to five links that you can um, attach if you have a website or examples, video links of um, things that reference the work. Again, this is optional. All questions are required unless otherwise noted. So those last two attachments and links, those are optional. Everything else is required. Okay, so just a couple of things um, about the application process. We have a review panel that changes every year um, and it re represents a diverse community of experts in the arts and human services from across the state. So we are in the works right now of gathering a gangbusters team um, of representatives from across Colorado, um, community members, leaders, um, funders, artists, um, and these folks change every year. So if you have um, applied in the past, you know, I really, really encourage you to apply again because it's a whole new set of folks who are reviewing these um, and it can't hurt. And it's the LOI process now too. So it's a little, it's less of a load. So, you know, and again, if you've applied, if you've applied before, I know there's a lot of folks in the, in the room who have applied in the past. Um, and we do offer feedback calls after um, the application process, but it's limited and not everyone is able to, um, to get in on one of those calls. So when you um, sign up for office hours with me, and again, I'll go over this um, at the end of the call here, but when you sign up for office hours with me, put in the notes that um, you want to talk about a past application, and I'd be happy to pull that up while we're talking and see what kind of feedback I can provide for you. Um, so just so you guys know, because I know a lot of folks are um, have applied before. And then um, our funding partners also participate on the panel and review pop process. So those funders that we listed at the um, at the beginning, including our two two new funders, um, will be part of the final review um, and decision making process. 
And then our grantees will be notified and funds will be dispersed in March of 2024 and funds um, or the grantees will be formally announced in April of 2024. So springtime. So I'm going to talk about budget a little bit. Again, budget is not required for this application um, initial, the initial part of the application process for the letter of intent. Um, but we are hoping to be uh, to at, to be asked to do a full proposal. So it's always a good idea to be thinking about your budget, um, and you need to know what you're asking for, you know, financially um, in the letter letter of intent process. Um, so it's good to be thinking about your budget. Um, so first and foremost, be realistic in your budget and account for all costs related to your project, um, any and everything. And this includes paying yourself. So what is your role in this project? Maybe you're the artist. Maybe you're an administrator. Maybe you're um, a community leader. Um, but I want to make sure that everyone is keeping in mind, you know, their own labor, um, especially if you are a working artist, um, a lot of times we find ourselves putting together just, you know, brilliantly intricate projects and it just feels like so natural for us that it's like, oh yeah, I guess I could pay myself. Please do. Um, please do. <laughs> Consider the cost of the learning community travel um, when you are planning your budget. So we did mention that we have our learning community meetings. Um, these we do all over the state. We're really trying to get um, in different parts of the state right now. Um, and so you will be traveling. And so just, you know, um, include that in your budget. It's always good to include travel in general, just kind of a spot for um, miscellaneous travel. We do uh, provide very limited reimbursement um, for travel for grantees, um, but it doesn't cover all of it. So um, that's a good thing to include. And then um, back to paying yourself, this is you know also important. Remember to allocate funds for artists and admin. So maybe, maybe you are, um, Maybe you're a teacher and you're putting together a project and you want to bring in a bunch of, you want to bring in an artist and um, an art therapist, for example. Make sure you have line items to, to pay the artist and the art therapist. Um, you want to make sure that the folks who you are engaging are, um, are being paid for their time. And then I always encourage folks to really allow your budget to tell the story of your project. Um, it's, you know, numbers are not always the immediate <laughs> uh, kind of like favorite go-to for artists. I mean, that's not, you know, everyone's different, but, um, but I have really learned over the years how, how your budget can act as a tool of your story by, by demonstrating things like we're paying artists, we're paying teachers, um, we're paying youth, right? Like maybe you're doing a project where you're working with um, young artists who are in high school and you're having them do some community organizing. Well, having stipends to pay the youth artists for their time really shows your, um, your values um, and shows what the mission of your work is. I also think this is a really good place to show that you are working with local vendors, that you're um, keeping the funds in your community in Colorado. Um, you know, I saw an application once that was bringing an artist in from another state and pretty much all of the budget was, you know, paying that artist, paying for their flight, paying for them to come out. And, and that was kind of it. And there really wasn't anything that was happening, you know, where the money was staying in the state. And again, this is a Colorado grant. We have Colorado Creative Industries on our, um, on our funding partners, and we really want to see, uh, these funds supporting and nurturing the Colorado community. So that's another um, a way for you to kind of show that in your budget. Okay, some other things about your application. Thinking about your project activities. Um, so as you're imagining what it is that this project is, what's happening, what's being done? Are people, um, are your people meeting in a community center to paint a mural together and it's happening on the weekends um, over the summer? Is it um, a one day event that it's just, we're ramping up for months and months to do a one day thing? Um, is it the creation of a uh, 
public artwork that is going to be um, installed in the community, you know, forever. Um, so, you know, really be thinking about what, what form does the project take um, in terms of activities and, uh, and community engagement. Be really specific about who that community is. Um, are you working with veterans? Are you working with immigrants? Um, are you working with middle schoolers? And then this piece is really, really important. Um, is this for or with? And when we say this, what we mean is, is this something where people are coming in, dropping something off for people and then leaving? Or is this a project where the, the leader of the project is working with the community, is part of the community, and it's something that is happening collaboratively um, within the town or community. We really want it, we want this to be authentic. We, um, you know, we've seen it before uh, where, you know, organizations or big entities come in, kind of build a thing and then leave. And then it's like, okay, well now we have this thing. What are we supposed to do with it? How are we supposed to maintain it? Um, you know, we want to see projects that are nurturing the community in really meaningful ways um, and lasting ways. All of that said, you do not need to have all of your partnerships finalized. Um, again, we know this is a letter of intent, what you intend to do. Um, and so you might not have your, um, your partnerships lying down. For example, you might be like, I know I want to work and work with libraries, but I don't know which library yet. So this is, um, you know, this would be a place for you to say, I want to work in libraries and I'm looking at particularly um, the Jefferson County library system, for example. Um, or, you know, I know I want to work in, in um, a senior center. And so I am drafting a letter to send to senior centers um, in my area. So you might not have, you might not know exactly the library or exactly the senior center you're working in, but you know who, you know, who it is you're looking for. Okay, so now we're going to jump into examples of funded projects. Um, and this is really just to kind of give you an idea of what it is that we um, have funded before. Um, and we do have all of these on our website as well. Um, and I really encourage you to check it out and, um, and see what we have funded in the past. Um, they're also just really cool. Like every, every, all of this work is just really, really cool. Um, so first we have Tara Rinders and Tara Rinders is a two-time, two-time grantee or three, two, um, current grantee for um, the clinic. And Tara's project, the purpose is to bring a new culture of cure to Rose Medical Center through movement classes, dance, films, and performance. Um, and this is a multifaceted program that addressed compassion fatigue and nurse burnout. Uh, First Do No Harm was performed in the hospital in the fall of 2018. Um, and there have been ongoing workshops, ongoing performances. Um, and I will say, you know, uh, Tara was doing this work when the pandemic hit and everything, everything imploded, right? We all know we were there. Um, and she saw, whoa, <laughs> this work, like this work was already needed, but now it's like way needed. Um, and so she, you know, she very quickly, very swiftly moved everything, um, onto zoom. She started partnering with a number of other, um, creative professionals, um, art therapists, people who are in the realm of healing and art and, um, and has really built this beautiful network of um, support uh, for folks, both in the medical field um, and really just anyone who needs it. So it's really, really incredible, beautiful work, but I think it's a wonderful example for arts and society because it demonstrates that connection between the arts, movement, dance, performance, and a social issue, nurse uh, burnout, com uh, compassion fatigue, um, caretaker fatigue, and seeing that creating a space for movement and, um, and dance for those folks was incredibly healing. Another example is right here in Alamosa. Um, this is with Think360 Arts and the Boys and Girls Club of the San Luis Valley. 
We had teaching artist Eric Dallimore and um, the team from Think360 and local artist Nora McBride. They all worked with the Boys and Girls Club um, to create a beautiful mural that celebrates the San Luis Valley um, and the intergenerational communities that we have here. Um, the piece was installed at the Rio Grande Farm Park, which is um, just down the road, and it is just this, it's beautiful. I love it. I'm like just so happy every time I go and see this mural um, and just knowing the the collaboration and the work that went into it um, was really, really cool. If you're ever in Alamosa, come check it out. Okay, another example is Just Us, Stories from the Front Lines of the Criminal Justice System. This is uh, Modus Theater and the work was done in Denver and Boulder. Modus Theater, um, Modus Theater's Just Us project supported community leaders who were impacted by the carceral system. Um, and so what they did is they brought folks um, who had been impacted to tell these incredible stories um, through monologues, through performance. And it was, again, just like a very healing and um, powerful process. Um, what they did also is they brought, you know, they brought all kinds of people who are part of this system together. Um, and so you'll see up here in the top right, um, you know, they had law enforcement um, professionals come in and also perform these monologues. Um, they were also funded again for a similar project that was uh, about immigration and immigration stories. So again, using um, the arts, performance, theater, monologues, um, as a vehicle for um, telling these stories about incarceration, um, the prison industrial complex, and immigration. Another example is Stories of Solidarity, Japanese Arts Network that's in Denver, Colorado. And uh, the Japanese Arts Experience in Five Points um, is a collaborative multidisciplinary audio, visual, and public art storytelling project that shares the narratives about the Japanese diaspora um, and other communities of color in Denver's historic five points. That should say neighborhood, <laughs> not neighborhood. <laughs> we'll go with it. Um, but this, this project is just so wonderful because, you know, in five points in Denver, there's an incredible history of jazz, an incredible history of Black Americans. Um, we have the Juneteenth Festival. And this is, you know, this is, uh, I, I don't want to say it's like so widely known, but it's something that, you know, we in Denver um, know of. And then there's this whole other history of diaspora, this whole other history of, um, of movement of Japanese um, immigrants to the area. And, um, and this project really, really uh, takes an opportunity to tell those stories and to, to add to the already very layered um, history and story of the Five Points neighborhood. Here are some, some of the images from that project. I just, and I'm just obsessed with this uh, on the bottom right of the, the baseball team. They just look so happy. Um, anyway, I love this project. All right, another project example is the Buffalo Soldier Interpretation at Fort Garland Museum and Cultural Center. This is in Fort Garland, Colorado. Um, also in Southern Colorado. And this show opened, I want to say last month. So it's open right now. Um, I'm going to catch it, I think this weekend. Um, so this, the exhibition that came out of um, their Arts and Society project is open to the public right now in Fort Garland. Um, this exhibition is um, about around uh, artist Chip Thomas, AKA Jetsonorama. Um, and he is he has researched and worked with other artists um, and community partners to tell the story of the Buffalo soldiers. That's black soldiers um, who fought in the civil war. So there's the Fort Garland site down there and some of the partners, the pink, the guy in the pink hat is that's a chip, that's the artist. So we have more examples on our website, as I mentioned, I encourage you to go check it out to get some more ideas. And then um, this is our information, my email and uh, our website also got Louise's email on there and our Instagram. So you can check things out. 
Um, I also want to just very quickly show you. Do, do, do. So if you go to our website, um, you'll go to apply for arts and society. And then here you'll see we have um, a link to the application here. And the application is on submittable. Just wanted to pull this up so you can see it. Um, and see here it says ends on September. I don't know why they do this on September 2nd at 12 a.m. 11.59 on the 1st, the 2nd, yeah. <laughs> so there's some information here and then you know, you'll make your account um, and log in. But as I mentioned, I do have on here on our website, the letter of intent is listed here. So you can kind of look through this before you jump into submittable if you'd like. And then um, I also have, my link for office hours. So if you go to the website, um, I have a link here, sign up for office hours. Um, this will take you to my Calendly page um, where you can pick one of these dates and sign up for a time um, to chat with me. Um, because I'm, yeah, Zoom, too much Zoom. <laughs> um, it will be a phone call. I do phone calls only for office hours. Um, for arts and society, and I will be, um, I will call you. So you'll just give me your name, your information, phone number, and I'll give you a ring. So we have just a few minutes left, um, and we still have a lot of folks in the room. So I think maybe the best thing to do, I'll go ahead and leave um, this up for just a minute. So you can make sure to write down my email if you don't have it already. Um, and Maybe, Louise, do we want to do um, a quick round of Q&A questions and maybe um, maybe we'll just ask folks to raise their hands. Does that work? Just since we have so many folks in the room. Are you able to see that, Louise, when folks do that? I would say you would need to take down your presentation so that okay. all, because it may be hard with the hundred plus, or yeah, run. You know. Okay, so. Yeah. I will um, email the the video and the slide deck will be emailed to everyone. So uh, fear not as I pull the presentation down. All right. So if folks have questions, um, yeah. feel free to raise your hand and, and Louise uh, will call on folks. Does that sound good, Louise? Yeah, and so Kathy, I saw you first, and then we'll go to Joanne. Um, and my apologies if I'm mispronouncing any names. Just feel free to introduce yourself as you begin talking, so it can be the record. Give me right. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Kathy McAlpine, and um, I wanted to ask. Well, we have a project that will cover a variety of areas, and um, is that okay to have something that? Uh, literally can span from education, healthcare, to the, the whole gamut. And can you use some people, well, I guess, can I just say this out? For example, I had a dental student who's an artist, but she taught the kids how to draw a tooth and one brush their teeth 52 times after. But, you know, we do a lot of that meshing. So some of the people wouldn't be considered necessarily their whole profession is artist, but they have that side to them. Can you use them as collaborators too? Or do you need someone that their whole life is, is that? I, I mean, truly you can utilize anyone um, as your collaborating team that, you know, the thing that I enjoy most about this program is that I can't think of one type, category, human entity that would not be included in this grant program, which is why I like it. It's all, all welcome to help achieve your project's cross-sector impact. And it's really you who are the expert in who that would be. So the panel really does not take this paternalistic appoint, uh, approach, thank goodness, <laughs> we need less of that in our lives, right? It, it is more, um, you guys are the experts, so share with the panel why these individuals have come together and who they are for this purpose, and, and it is all, all welcome. I love this grant program because it lets me be my natural at rest state, which is the yes human, so. <laughs> yes, hey, okay, just say yes now, okay, thank you.
<laughs> Maybe if I could, everybody like no, I know. Hey, um, but so 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 architects and engineers are considered artists, and arts and crafts are some of the things. Okay, um, thank you. I won't take up more space from other people. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Go in. Uh, thanks. I have a kind of a two part budget question. Um, the first is, I know it's not a matching grant, but are you looking for us to also have additional funding? Um, so that's kind of the first question. And then the second question is um, paying the artists, um, like are you, if they're creating pieces for the project, are you paying them by, should we like do it by the piece? Should we do it hourly? Like kind of what are you kind of looking for when it comes to paying artists? Thanks. I have to ask you to repeat the first question already. Okay, oh, sorry. <laughs> so um, sorry. I know it's not a matching grant, but are you looking for us to have yes, additional I, funding? Um, no, you do not have to have additional funding at all. If you do, great. If you're looking for other funding, great. You can always include that. Um, sometimes folks will put like, you know, three in their bud, you know, in their budget, they'll put um in the income line you know, a couple of grants they've applied for and they'll say, you know, pending application sent. Um, and, you know, it, it's, I think it's great to show when you're looking for other things, especially if your total budget is over the max you can ask for, right? If your total budget is 50,000 and you're asking for 35,000, it can be very helpful um, to show us, you know, what is it that you want? Uh, um, how is it, how is it that you're going to fund the rest of this, right? Right. They do look for feasibility for sure. Yes. So if you're asking for five grand and the budget is 150,000 sure. and you have no one else in the mix, they're going to be like, how oh, is this possible? So thankfully it's a very like, you know, the, the panelists, because again, the panelists are oftentimes you guys, you know, many of the arts and society panelists are alumni grantees. So understand the work in the area intentionally, right? Um, so I would say uh, it's just really more of a feasibility uh, question in terms of how you present your budget. And then in terms of, you know, the second part of the question, which is, you know, how you how you structure artist payments, I would say ask the artists, you know, see how they would like to be paid and how their work um, can be honored in the way that is consistent with how they operate in their practice. And if they're not sure, then I would say it depends upon kind of how, how the grant structure as far as is it project based like are they producing a mural which would be an honorarium or a stipend for that mural or is it a workshop where potentially based on the quantity of workshops they get a fee for workshop um if you want to chat with others or myself about this too feel free we we definitely um understand that part of what is a challenge in our sector is that there's no form for for artist wages, which I fight against all the time. Um, I want artists to unionize. <laughs> so, um, but we're but, working on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I we definitely happy to help uh, in terms of how. And you know, you think of it in terms of percentage of your overall budget, right? So mm -hmm. you know, how how that all breaks down. So happy to drill down with that um, based on your format and and project timeline. Thank you. And then to answer your question about how much to pay artists, um, unfortunately, there isn't like a, a tried and true, this is how it is. Um, um, sorry, I'm scrolling and doing all the things. Um, we can talk about it. We can chat about it one-on-one -on -one, um, over email or in a, um, uh, what's it called? Oh my God, my brain is like already melting. It's not even one o'clock yet. Um, during uh, the office hours. Usually what I do is I initially say the artists will tell you what they charge, right? Um, the artists themselves should be the ones kind of dictating what their pricing is. Now, you might not have the artists identified yet. You might not have all of that figured out. And so we can talk about kind of like within the context of your project, what uh, what works, what makes sense. Does that help? That's That's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna pop over to Joanna and then go to Casey. Hey, 
I was wondering when you talked about the learning community meetings, the evaluation support and the marketing and communication support, if you are a funded grantee, are those required or are those just supplemental things that they can participate in? Um, supplemental that you can participate in mostly some things, um, are required, but it's, um, the learning communities are required. You are required to attend those. And, um, we often ask grantees to send, you know, send someone from your project who maybe has never been to a meeting like this before. Um, you know, it can be different folks from the organization, but the meetings are required. Um, the marketing and evaluation and, um, and all of that is really sort of you use it how it best fits and suits you. Anything to add to that, yeah. Louise? Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Hey, Casey. Great. Thank you. Thank you for this. Um, it was super helpful to hear all of it. Um, I was curious, I guess it's a little bit about um, pricing and or, uh, cost and timeline because the community I'm working with is very like already, we're already in progress. And so I'm curious if the timeline starts like before the award date, and um, if there's expenses incurred before the award date, if we could get that reimbursed, like if the artists wanted to purchase some things before we got the money and then we miraculously got the money in, in April or whatever, um, if we could like retroactively reimburse the artist afterwards or reimburse um, whatever that was, whatever the charge was. I'm going to punt this to you, Louise, because I feel like you, yeah. No, so yeah, let me make sure I'm understanding the question correctly here. So you're saying uh, the in relationship to the cost of the learning community meeting or relationship to your grant in general? The grant in general. So like if the budget we submit, we start, basically we start spending it down before the money is awarded. We're awarded the money. Um, could we retroactively reimburse the artist or whatever um, community? I mean, yeah, we we definitely don't get involved on that level okay. of how you you know once you get the grant and you're gonna you're gonna have agency on two levels when it comes to how the funding gets to you. You can either say this is a one year grant and you're gonna get it all in one lump sum and then you're gonna manage it from that point out, or you can say it's a two year grant and you're gonna parse it out. You're gonna get half be at the very beginning of the grant cycle and the other half when you submit an interim report as you round the bin for the second year so um but in terms of what you utilize it with once what you um once you get it as far as retroactive pay you know it's fine it just what's important about it is that that the project actually occurs during the grant term so as opposed to like you can't apply for a grant for this cycle and the project happened in like 2017 and you're like ha thanks for being there guys surprise you know it needs to be something that is actively going on now if that makes yeah. sense yeah so like for example i'm hosting i'm currently hosting community meetings and designing this this art project and like in my mind i'm I'm ideally would be paying these folks as we're dwindling down the current budget if I could retroactively pay them for this the continuation of it for some meeting that happened in January of next year before the grant was funded that's what I was kind of piecing out so yeah yeah thank you early um I did want to just raise also kind of the issue about uh Deborah raised um about tax exemption you know for those of you who are individuals who are applying for this grant Obviously that, you know, the income and expense can be addressed on a schedule C where you just, you know, you just got to be a good uh, clerk to your process and keep all those receipts. So it gets balanced out and, and nets out to zero. So you don't have an, an insane tax bill and, and note that like, if you have, if you're an artist and you have a studio, you can write that off as part of, you know, the overall budget costs in this, or as Lada has mentioned, uh, Redline does, um, operate as a fiscal sponsor to those of you who, you know, are, you know, the word schedule C is terrifying, which I totally get because all things taxes can be terrifying at times. So we're just happy to uh, meet you where you are with that and, and um, help support you doing the work you need to do and have been called to do in your communities without necessarily uh, 
you know, thinking that the IRS is going to come and get you, which is, yeah, oftentimes how I start conversations with artists and their concern. So, <laughs> so just to clarify in that front. Thank you, Louise. And thank you, everyone. Um, there have been so many great questions. I'm just, yeah, I'm looking at this awesome chat. So many great folks in the room. Um, Kathy, did you have another question? So currently we have people uh, volunteering for different agencies to, to help us. And so we probably couldn't afford to to pay all of them, um, but we could pay for ourselves and the interns and that kind of thing to host the meeting because we get, sometimes we get, you know, people that are working for companies to do projects for the, for the, the group that we're doing projects with, and we're going to reach out and we keep reaching out to a variety of age, group, age groups, but I would hate to open it up I, for pay for them because we probably couldn't afford it. And then also I'm trying to get them to be more altruistic in their lives anyway, some of the folks, but I would like to be able to pay for maybe like the intern, you know, um, some other people involved. Can you do it like that too? Because yeah, maybe we pay some people, but not pay others, you know, are you going to pay the director of some major company that makes more than all of us ever think about? No. Or are you, <laughs> <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? Sure. It's, I wondered if that's okay. It, yeah. Everything is okay. Again, the, the, we, we don't get involved on that level. It's how you, how you believe that this work should be paid and structured. But what I would say is that if you are leaning on in kind or pro bono activities, list those as well, because those should be counted. It is relationships you have. It's generous people that you work with that, you know, you can recognize in your overall budget burden, which will, is just good for you to have for future grants anyway. So recognize those donations of time and, and facilities and support, because again, it shows your whole picture and it shows what you have brought together as a program director to make this work happen and the scope of what the work is. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, everyone. Well, in the spirit of respecting time, um, I hope that everyone has plans to go frolic in a field after this. Um, so please go frolic. I have attached um, or put my email as well as the website in the chat. So go ahead and grab that real quick before we close the meeting. Again, I will be emailing the video and the slide deck out to you um, and we'll be putting all of this on our website. Yes, Katie, go frolic. <laughs> and the one thing I do just wanna share is, um, you know, I call it the Arts and Society Roadshow because we love you guys and we wanna come see you, but we have been more and more hosting information sessions and learning community sessions outside of Denver Metro. Um, so if you're interested in kind of bringing Lara's or myself, or sometimes some of the funding partners will travel uh, to do an information session in your community that you feel like an in-person session would be more accessible, uh, we are happy to come and do that during these application cycle periods. You know, oftentimes it's in the summer, we've already been um, to Grand Junction and Trinidad and Alamosa and, and Colorado Springs. So, you know, please reach out to us because we're happy to come to your community and have sit down conversations, which we know, you know, as a nonprofit that works within communities that that is, that is oftentimes invaluable. And I also just from a word of encouragement, even if you are not funded by Arts and Society, what this does do is put your project in front of six funders. So think of it also in terms of efficiency. Like this project may not be funded by Arts and Society, but people at the Carl Health Foundation, at El Pomar, at, you know, the oftentimes funders that are not part of the collaborative, but have been asked to sit on the panel um, you know, can see your project. And I have seen the most magical thing happen during these as a nonprofit director where a funder will be like, I want to fund that project. And then they go live their best life with you. And it's amazing. So, so don't be discouraged if you don't get funded because know that 
the efficiency of this application in terms of who's reading it, it, it sometimes gets through and works. So I just want to share that as someone who wishes that every grant I applied to actually put my <laughs> words in front of a panel of many people that potentially could connect with the work. So just wanted to leave you with that too. Throw it at the wall, see if it sticks, you know? <laughs> And yeah, please let us know if you want us to come come visit if you've got a group that would um, want to hear from us. Louise and I love an excuse to uh, to travel and, you know, crash your town. So. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we love you, Colorado. We really do so much. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful Monday. Um, I look forward to seeing your letters of intent and um, we will. Well, yeah, we'll see you. All right.